Times leads with Rishi Sudak's plans to lure early retirees back into work with the headline over 50s encouraged to end early retirement. The Telegraph leads with the rise in defence spending with an estimated £1 billion extra needed for the Ministry of Defence to avoid real-term cuts over the next two years. The Guardian, a stay on the topic of strikes and how unions are reportedly accusing ministers of causing festive travel chaos. The Daily Mail takes a different angle on strikes, claiming that the NHS are wasting millions on woke non-jobs as frontline workers strike for better pay. Mm, there we go. And finally, we've got the Mirror. They are leading with what we can expect from Charles' first Christmas speech as king, with the headline, Always Close to Mama. Oh. I think it will be sad tomorrow, actually, when he does his king's speech. I think it will be... People will realise, I think, for the first time that we don't have... Her Majesty with us any longer. Oh, very, very sad. All right, time to go through the papers now. And joining us this morning is the editor of Spiked, Tom Slater, and journalist and playwright Emma Burnell. Good morning to you Good morning. both. Um, Emma, should we start with you, shall we? Um, the front of the Times looking at retirement. Over 50s are encouraged to, to end retirement and get back to work. Yeah, this is um, classic government announcement itis in many ways. Um, <laughs> the thing is, A, um, People who have retired have done so because they've done their finances and they've worked out that they can afford to, um, they've chosen a different lifestyle. It is quite difficult to tempt someone back from that different lifestyle. But also, we keep saying over 50s as if this is one lump group between 50 and the um, standard retirement age. And actually, if you're 50, you might have 15 years ahead of you. You can retrain, have your CV judged, as um, uh, Rishi Sunak's talking about, maybe go in to learn a new skill and stuff. If you're 60 to 62, 63, you are not going to do that. And actually, the working options for you are considerably narrowed. And I think it's really important that when we lump everyone together like this, that we don't make that mistake because... An offer for someone of 51, 52 who's gone for early retirement will be completely different from someone in that age group. Oh. Yeah, Tom, I'll bring you in on this. I mean, he's desperately just trying to tax more people. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, and there is a kind of underlying striking problem here, which is the, the amount of people who are kind of economically inactive who could probably work. And that's not just about squeezing the pips out of people. It's very important that people have something to do with their time. It gives them a sense of purpose in life and so on. I'm not entirely sure the problem is necessarily all people who took early retirement, though. This is quite a deep and profound problem, which was also really exacerbated by the pandemic and the lockdowns and so on. A lot of people just went off the map from the workforce and never really came back. But yeah, it does, It does. when you're talking about things in such broad brush strokes, as Emma was saying, it doesn't necessarily get the full complexity of the matter, I guess. No, and you said that people who have their finances in order will be able to retire. I will clearly never retire. No, I'm just, um, <laughs> Me and you both, Patrick. <laughs> I dream. I will die in this chair. I will. Uh, Tom, right, so you, over to you now in The Times. Yes, so Again. story here about um, British volunteers out in Ukraine and how they'll be spending their Christmas, so one of which is Chris Garrett, he's a former tree surgeon, um, and he's going to be spending his time diffusing explosives, essentially, so anti-tank yeah. mines and missiles and things, and driving them around, as well as delivering a lot of humanitarian aid. Chris, who, in this particular story, is a self-funded volunteer. He's not working with the military directly. He's just gone out there on his own steam. And it is just a reminder of that amazing sort of internationalism, mm. real internationalism, not sharing a few hashtags yeah. and having a second home in the south of France, as some people would have, but genuinely putting your lives on the line for another nation's cause. Yeah. It is really inspiring. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's not our war, but to go over and do that mm. for, for another country, mm. I mean, especially at this time of year, I mean, it really, really is incredible. It's cold as well yeah. in Ukraine. Yeah. Right? Minus 15 or something. Mm. No. no, I think the, the British solidarity with Ukraine has been something that left, right, Labour, Conservative, whatever you are, um, you can be really, really proud of. I will be spending Christmas with um, the Ukrainian mother and son who are living with my parents at the moment. Um, I haven't met them yet, they've only just arrived. And, and I think that, again, that's an exemplar of the fact that we've all pulled together. This isn't, this isn't partisan, it, yeah, it's something that I think we're all really quite proud of and can come together over. And that sense of, as, as Tom says, international solidarity and a real understanding that this war may not be our war, but it matters to us. Mm, mm. And I think there's something quite British, isn't there, about you know the Second World War and the Blitz mm. and, and coming together um, and 
and standing strong, and that's what we're seeing now with, with the Ukrainians. Yeah. I think there's something quite British about, mm. about the way that we're um, responding to that. Um, Emma, should we look at train fares, shall we? Because not only are trains not running, but they're also getting more expensive. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you live outside of London, um, you may well have asked what difference the train strikes actually made, because yeah. the, the odds of getting a train seem to be reducing on a daily basis. Um, and so the response of the train companies is to put fares up by nearly 6%. That makes sense to me. Um, so there is a real sense that people who have discovered that working from home is considerably easier, uh, that we live in a, a much more um, digitally connected world, they're not going to be getting on these trains anymore. Um, and I, you know, we need um, a certain amount of interconnectivity. We are very bad, for example, in this country at travelling east to west rather than just north to south. But we need a sense that that is going to be affordable for people, and I just don't see that coming anytime soon. No, not so. I mean, it does see. I mean, I occasionally, well, I, I'm driving back up, of course, up north tomorrow. You can't get a train, can you? Can't get a train, mm -hmm. no. But actually, to be fair, I can't get a train a lot of the time anyway. I mean, I don't want to name names, but Avanti West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely shocking. And some people will be wondering what on earth we're even paying for. Well, I think that's exactly it. I think part, this is partly behind the surprising level or what you know historically is quite surprisingly high level of public support for the strikes mm -hmm. as well as because of the fact that people recognize that given the state of the railways given the fact that you were still having these companies extracting profits yeah. during the pandemic no one's really blaming the train guard or the driver mm -hmm. for that problem you know it's quite clear that there's a really stark issue here and as Emma was saying many people will struggle to see the difference from one strike day to just another supposedly day of normal service you know are we, uh, are we off to Qatar now Tom in the Telegraph yes so, right? yes yeah, so this is um, the ongoing story of EU corruption which has been really striking I mean the scale of what we were talking about here Eva Kylie was a 44 year old um, former one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament part of this operation essentially and lobbying on behalf of Qatar where they found almost a billion euros worth of cash in these various Eurocrats' homes. So really quite striking, such a kind of almost crude corruption scandal by any kind of measure. I'm just always quite struck by, with some honourable exceptions, how little coverage this story yeah. has sort of generated. It hasn't really cut through. And I think it is a bit of a reminder that for, people don't pay that much attention to the European <laughs> Union, uh, not least because it is ultimately something which doesn't, you know, doesn't have that kind of extra level of scrutiny and democratic accountability that a genuine democratic system does. And also, I think it's because of the fact that the EU is so anti-democratic, you do have a bit more room for these lobby groups to operate. That's certainly something that researchers have noticed over the years. So, yeah, a really striking story. It really gets to the heart of a lot of the fundamental problems within the European Union, but also the lack of interest, even from uh, media, which claims to be very European, I think is quite interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I must say, I was quite startled by it. And like you said, as well, I like your turn of phrase about how crude it was. Mm. Just bags of cash. It's like something out of a cartoon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Men show up with the silver briefcases and then, you know, yeah. leave. But there we go. And mostly on the radar as well. No, really good point. Um, Emma, something completely different in Sun. <laughs> this is, uh, okay. we hate White Christmas by Wham so much that we're trying to ban it. Yeah, a couple are apparently trying to buy the rights to White Christmas so that they can stop it ever being played again on the radio. Now, uh, uh, this strikes me as the kind of anti-free speech that, uh, thing that the GB News should be for, uh, campaigning against. Um, the slightly more serious point, White Christmas was released the same year as Do They Know It's Christmas by Band-Aid, and the band have in perpetuity donated their royalties to anti-famine charities. That still happens to this day, as far as I know. So actually, if you stop it being played on the radio, you're robbing charity at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost, almost that. like they haven't thought it through. Is yes. it? Amazing. Yeah, they haven't bothered to get into it. <laughs> Who's Christmas number one this year? Lad Baby. Or Again. Honestly, Christmas number one, any number one, I'm, I'm 47. This is well out of my comfort Over. zone. No, yeah. yeah, but it's just... I that mean, look, I haven't listened to it, but I'm, I'm now... I'm now, remarkably, at the age where I'm listening to Smooth FM. <laughs> <laughs> when did that happen? That happened. That happened I'm about three months into Smooth FM. Oh, yeah, right. uh, it's yeah. a new transition for you. Yeah, it is. I am. I am indeed transitioning. Um, <laughs> Tom, just as turkey, yeah? Yeah, it's a really, really big one, Patrick. Yeah. A very expensive one. Um, so someone's found a giant turkey in the Morrisons. Well. £136 price tag for this £15 wow. turkey. And they've obviously sent some sort of um, junior trainee reporter on 
sky scanner and found out that you can get a flight to Turkey for less money than that. Then so you can buy a turkey. Exactly. Well, there you I'm go. Not sure got a lot how many people does that feed, Tom? Do we know? So apparently it's big enough to feed 12 people. Not even oh, that that's many. not so bad then per head. House, per yeah. head, that's not that expensive then. Oh, see, I think that needs to feed about 50 people. <laughs> I mean, frankly, if you've given me that much turkey, then yeah, the, the freezer's going to gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point. You'd have to trust it before you put it in your freezer, I think. But, I mean, just buy a chicken. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. When it was just me and my ex, we used to do a duck. It was lovely. It was really? perfect. Nice. Yeah. What happened to the Christmas goose? I feel like this is... Have you ever tried to cook a goo? Oh, right, well, there you go. Yeah. Keep it the, light. The fat <laughs> spilling over ruined my grandmother's floor once. That's why you don't cook a goose anymore. Oh, a goose? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Oh. So what are we all having? Are we all having turkey? Turkey. Turkey? Turkey. Right. Every meat under the sun cooked by my amazing brother-in-law and then the Christmas cake, boozy chocolate Christmas cake made oh. by yours truly. Well, that sounds lovely. <laughs> Might need the right. recipe for what that. What about you? I'm having beef. Beef. I know, I'm breaking tradition. I'm also having beef. Are you? Oh I am. my god. There you go, Do you see? like turkey? Rib beef. I like turkey, I prefer beef. Me mm. too. Yeah. Me too. I yeah. find turkey a bit dry. Yeah. I'll be it honest. Can be. You've got to flip it up so cook it like yeah. breast down. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the tactic. And lots of basting. And lots of yeah. basting. Well, I do think if, it, if turkey was that good, would we not eat it all year round? Yes, exactly. This is the thing, <laughs> isn't it? And they're also yeah. funny looking things. Anyway. So funny looking. Yeah. 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 Oh, say, I said what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you know what? do you know what? They're quite scary. You oh, heard it here first, <laughs> folks. Then that. Yeah, you heard it here first. Right, well, thank you very much for uh, bringing us all of the latest headlines. A variety of stories yeah. there, from the serious <laughs> over down nice to thing. turkeys. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and you will be back, won't you? We will, indeed. Lots Good. more fun. More highbrow <laughs> <More> high <laughs> stuff in the next hour.